senior lecture series. Um, you'd think I'd be used to going first with a last name of Abram, but um, you know sometimes it's still uh, still quite a surprise. So I started out uh, looking forward to figuring out um, where did all these buildings come from. By the way, this is the Kings County dedication. I, I could not find where it came from, but it's listed in multiple documents and actually engraved inside the B building. Where did that building come from? So, as you know, Kings County has a very long and storied history. Um, it's really easy to miss. We run around the hospital, we're residents, we do this, we do that. You know, compressions, stat, epi. Um, we do our 24 hour shifts in the ICU. And the whole time, you know, I'm going through it. I'm like, well, what are all these other buildings doing here? What, what are we, what are we doing? You know, our hospital's been around for a really long time. What happened? Um, it's really hard to forget the, the tales the buildings tell us. Uh, but sometimes they've been forgotten, and I'd like to bring back some of what that is. So while I started looking at the architecture and the stories of the buildings, I ended up actually finding a story of the people. The people are patients, the people are staff, the physicians, the, uh, all of the colleagues that we work with here. And so back to the patients. And let's get started. Since this originally was going to be a, about architecture, I wanted to have a blueprint to have an agenda. First, we're going to start with one fine day back in 1972. We're going to ask the question, where did they put all those people? <clears throat> and then we're going to figure out where they put people before 1931, between 1931 and 2001, and then between 2001 and today. And then, finally, I'm going to take a look back from our viewpoint now and just show you some of the highlights of where these buildings are right now. So here's a random day. May 15, 1972. It's conveniently picked because I happen to have a census from that day, but that's the day we're going to pick. I want to ask everyone just one thing. How many patients do you think we have admitted to Kings County Hospital? What's our capacity for between medicine, surgery, ICUs? Ballpark figure. Anyone? Right? Uh, capacity. What's, how much could we have? Inpatient? Inpatient. I hear 700, I hear 1,000, 600, 200, 500, all right, $1, Bob. All right, so keep those numbers in mind. On this fine day in 1972, General Medicine had 221 admitted patients. Special Medicine had their own services, including, I actually noted on the original paper, Dermatology carried 24 beds. I couldn't believe this, I couldn't believe this. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> not for my water bottle. Um, we also had prison medicine, which you may not have known. Uh, Dr. Sitter did give me some lovely stories about his time working in Kings County prior to the beginning of our program. Um, and then we had the medical ICU of 26 beds. General surgery only had 62, and special surgery, look at this, neurosurgery had 70 people. Ortho had 50. Trauma had 70. Plastic surgery, 16. Um, and then the SICU, which you would expect. Then looking at PEDS. I, I just didn't this to you guys can see this for yourself, right? We had 208 admitted pediatric patients on the medical service alone and another 106. There were 11 PEDS plastic surgery patients. I didn't even know we had plastic surgery <coughs> with PEDS. They had a few others, some urology and cancer, which for whatever reason weren't included in the main count. OBGYN had 142. And so that brought all the general care to 1374. We had 82 in the rehab, you know, PM and R, and our tuberculosis unit had 246 patients. Psychiatry and detox all came to another 387. And so our total hospital count was 2,089 patients on this day in 1972, plus 48 newborns. I suspect they were not included in the count because we came in as one patient and you exited in two, and I think they were also in different wards. But either way, that brings us to a total of over 2,100. Now 2013, so 200, 500, 1,000. Our total capacity is 639 patients at Kings County Hospital. I said, what? You mean we have all the six medicine teams, the A5 team, we have this, we have that, we have all these different services, and that's 639? No, it's less. That doesn't even count. It's only 246 on the medical surgical floors. 
we have an, then another um, 40 in the ICUs of all of the units that we've gone to or that we're, we're more familiar with. And psychiatry <coughs> is 205, including the detox units. So where did all these people go? I also put up a little side-by-side -side comparison. 1972 is the first column. On the left, 2013 is like the middle column, and then just running down on both sides. So our general med search kind of halved. Um, our ICUs are less. We don't have any, our, our surgical, our special surgery is out pretty much. Um, you know, we maintain closer to the number of newborns. Uh, we don't have a TB unit anymore. But this is how we went from 2,137 down to 639 capacity. So looking at the changing inpatient status, there are many factors here. Um, just for a brief summary, back in 1970s, in the early 1970s, the average length of stay was between 8 and 10 days. Now this is an average. Your patient who went in and had a baby, she was there for probably 5 or 6 days on average. Today, it's down to 2.7. The patient who went for a heart attack, 21 days was average length of stay. Now I, I did come across the fact that the Northeast did have notoriously longer inpatient times than other areas of the country, and that they weren't quite sure if this was more traditional medicine or different ages of the patient population, but for even adjusted for, um, uh, for other conditions, by condition alone, on average, the Northeast had the longest stay times, but not by much, maybe by a day or two. The average MI patient is down to between four and five days right now. So financial, obviously, Things used to reimburse more. <coughs> when they pay, we keep them in the hospital. They don't pay, we kick them out. Technological. So a lot of things that, you know, watch and wait. Appy, you know, seeing if things develop over time. PE, we're able to get an answer right away with a CT scan. <coughs> True, not perfect, but very, very good and good enough to not keep patients in the hospital for three or five days to observe them and just see what happens. Also, we have better medicine. Patients who no, couldn't tolerate PO give much better anti-emetics. They can go home on PO, PO medication. They don't have to take IV antibiotics, etc. We have infusion pumps at home. We have visiting nurse services. The hospital isn't necessarily the place you had to stay for a while. Also, staffing. It's you know always been a delicate balance between the nurse and the, and the patient ratio and the doctor and patient ratio. It's changed over time, but now there's more um, legal requirements about that. Or resources. You used to rest at the hospital, now you rest at home or in a skilled nursing facility. And finally, patient rights. In the 1970s, um, among many other reasons, a lot of mental health patients were released, uh, partially for uh, increase in patients' own autonomy and their right to be able to determine their own care, but just the idea that you don't need to stay cooped up in the hospital in order to get better. Maybe the hospital wasn't the place to get better, and maybe you, they caught up to the idea, maybe you start to catch things there too. So this is a map of Kings County from 1970. We've now discussed that there's been 2,100 admitted patients. Where were they? We didn't have the D building, we didn't have the S building. We had the A, the B, the C, and then a couple others that you're gonna see. So let's find out where they put all these people. Prior to 1931, way prior to 1931, we had the Brooklyn Alms House. An Alms House is a poor house, it's a synonym for the same thing. And these were used in the early 1800s to, uh, as a taxpayer-funded institution to keep people off the streets, basically. If someone was caught begging, they'd be brought to the poorhouse. Um, if you couldn't support yourself, you were brought there for other reasons. So what ended up is you had a whole motley gathering of people who were sick, who were poor, who were infirm. You also had alcoholics, other types of conditions that basically meant that you could support yourself or your family. So all of these are together. Um, in the early 1800s, Brooklyn was still six distinct towns. The X marks the spot, obviously that's where we are. Um, but the land was purchased out in the 1830s, 1831 <laughs> to be precise, um, to start building Brooklyn's own official almshouse and a county farm. Physical labor was viewed as being good and restorative for people. It gave people without a job a place to work and it was viewed as uh, physical therapy basically for the mentally ill. They first employed a physician, Dr. John B. Zabriskie, from 1831 until his death in 1848, and he was paid 
the hefty sum of $70 a year. So 1831 counties founded, 1834 Brooklyn becomes an official city, and at the time, just for a frame of reference, the population is 12,406. Now, um, I asked the Sally Huston sheets, I don't know if they got passed, or if we're gonna get passed out now. You know, keeping in mind the $70 a year salary, in case you thought things are expensive now, this is a fee bill from uh, 1845. It's fee for service at its finest. And I just thought it was actually quite fascinating the kinds of uh, charges that people had. So I apologize for the quality of the able to take a look and give you guys some ideas. Ordinary advice. Office, of, office advice was a dollar, and a letter of advice was five. So the Alms House continues to grow throughout the 1800s. We didn't have photographs. This is uh, a blue Delft paint, uh, blue Delft plate that actually has a depiction of the Brooklyn County Alms House in the fall. In 1857, there is a landmark report back to the city of Brooklyn on the state of the Alms House. The physician's salary is now $200 a year. They also have one resident physician and four attendants, but there's four departments at the Kings County Farm. There's the hospital, which is a four-story building. It had a smallpox, a pest wing. They had 430 patients. They were pleased for more because even then they were crowded. They had a children's hospital with 350 beds, a lunatic asylum, which had four stories uh, and 205 patients, and also <coughs> the were the Alms House, which was for the poor, um, which included 70 acres of county farm in Brooklyn. Most of Brooklyn was farmland, except for the part that's now downtown Brooklyn still at this time. And the Alms House had another 380 people. They had an engine house, a store, a bakehouse, and a physician's residence. But even with all these requests for official space, they didn't turn anyone away. So ironically, the same report also gives mention that, quote, having to operate in the wards is both inconvenient to the physician and distressing to the patients, mm -hmm. who are unwilling spectators at such scenes. In 1861, the population has uh, grown tremendously to over 250,000, and admissions around this time were about 6,000 annually. So this is a long length of stay. My favorite bridge growing up in Brooklyn, this is my favorite bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. It was finished in 1883, and right after that, there was such an increase in commerce between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Brooklyn was really a suburb at this point of Manhattan, um, Brooklyn Heights specifically. Uh, they, you know, they've been using, with the advent of steam, um, steam engines, they've been ferrying people across more and more, but now it truly had a way to get from one to the other. So, with the growing of the only general hospital in Brooklyn County, our county. Um, in 1897, they opened a nursing school with 19 students. And in 1898, two years after Brooklyn combined all six towns together into one Brooklyn as we know it today, we joined into New York City. And we were one of five boroughs. <coughs> so let's talk about some buildings here. This is a lovely building. It no longer exists. This is the original R building. And it was designed in 1908 to 1920. <coughs> Uh, possibly by a gentleman named Frank Hemley, who also designed the original nurse's home, which we'll see in a second. Um, colonial revival style, Beaux Arts trim. I originally thought this was going to be about a lot about architecture, but I think the people are much more interesting. Um, and so this housed all of this growing nursing school where they quickly went up to 100 per class. Our children's hospital. We had a children's hospital. It was, in fact, actually supposed to have a wing on each side, but as you can see, the one on uh, the east side of the building never actually got built, just the one on the west. This was in 1916. Around this time, also notable, I don't have the pictures in here anymore, but at Kings County sent a, a battalion, basically, an entire company of doctors and nurses to both World War I and World War II, who served over a year and a half um, in various theaters as, um, as as doctors and nurses. Uh, they were drafted at the request of the National Secretary of Defense. So we do have a long tradition of serving as well outside of Brooklyn. In the 1920s, and this is a photo of the nurses' basketball team. They played other nursing schools. Um, in the 1920s, it wasn't actually a, um, a poorhouse any longer. It was just a hospital. We we're just taking care of sick people. We're no longer the county farm. We no longer have a lunatic asylum. And just the hospital. In spite of the depression in 1929, $7 million was allocated to the rebuilding of Kings County. 
And this is really what brings us up to today. Where did they put all these people? That $7 million was not wasted. This is the New York City Mayor, Jimmy Walker, at a cornerstone laying ceremony for the New Kings County Hospital, July 9, 1831. So a few people have asked me, what's that? 1831 to 1931 on the B building right outside? This is it. 1831, the founding of Kings County, the first cornerstone. 1931, the beginning of the ABC complex. It's it was actually 100 years to the day after the first cornerstone was laid. And our ABC complex, the A, the B, the C building in a row, designed by Leroy Ward. It was uh, important because in 1934, we found Kings County at one of its highest peak censuses, over 3,160 beds. That was just in A, B, C, and then a D building, which was smaller, not the D building that we have today. It had only 240 beds. The <laughs> Brooklyn Cancer Institute then opened as well in the former Children's Hospital, the one that you just saw. And that in addition to nursing, the county was now teaching medical students. The Long Island College of Medicine, now known as Downstate, um, which was nearby at the time, uh, had 500 of those 3,000 beds assigned to them as teaching beds for the undergrads. The residents were still running the show back then, but they needed teaching material, uh, is the term actually used. They also requested more house staff. They finished some dorms for house staff in 1937. And the other notable changes at the time were that they instituted eight-hour workdays. It was noted that even though they had to hire more nursing staff, the eight-hour workdays were enjoyed by all. <laughs> <laughs> it was a smooth transition, apparently. And in, in 1938, we started a blood bank. This was the first blood bank of any public hospital in New York City. So this is our T building. And this is where we come into buildings that we know. This is the same T building that we have today. What was it built for? You know, when you go in, you see the welfare office, you see the auxiliary, the volunteers office, there's a maze of things. We talked to Janice Clark. <laughs> and, uh, right? And, uh, you know, that, that's at least the T building experience, which I'm familiar with. Um, but it was originally designed, again, by Leroy Ward to be similar to the A, B, and C complex. In 1938, it was a nurse's home and school. This housed the academic and the living needs of the nurses. So it served nursing functions. The Kings County Library being accessed by nurses. This is their graduation down here on the smaller picture. And this new thing called outpatient medicine was starting. Instead of going to your private physician at their own personal office, you had hospital offices that were outpatient. This is the U building. It's built next to the ABC complex, and it's where the RR building, the one that we know as the R, is today. It was demolished in order to make the new R. This is actually a psychiatric pavilion that was never built, but I thought it was very grandiose. 1.5 million was allocated in the 1940s and then reallocated away from it. But we were to have originally a very grand psychiatric building back then. In 1951, a new tuberculosis building was opened. There, it's, as they said, some 350 tuberculars will now be in the state-of-the-art facility. It actually had room for other chronic diseases with a max capacity of 750 patients. Our fantastic e-building. Now, the thing that's different now is that there's actually just a first floor extension um, where that long, the long hallway is leading between the S and sorry, the D and S in the e-building. Um, it's really just an extension of the first floor, and it leads right up to this. Until this was renovated in 2006, there were no major renovations that had been done to it, uh, not interior or structural. And I don't know if you can see, but in between each of these and porches, like screened-in porches, they're outdoor porches. I remember looking over there at one point in the e-building, I was on ENT or something, and I'm like, why is there a porch outside? Well, that was state-of-the-art treatment for your tuberculars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, another cornerstone laying of the, the tubercular and chronic disease pavilion. And when it was finally built, again, the porches, the large windows in front, they could take the sun, they could take the air, because people were living there for months, if not years. And a quick look back on the other side of the street, where we are now. The Long Island College of Medicine in 1947 uh, commissioned that downstate was going to be built. It had not yet been renamed. This is an aerial shot of the proposed building. It's a good chance to look at county. You can see closest to me is the T building, followed by the U, 
then our big ABC complex. Um, you can see the power plant in the background, and then far off to the right is the E building. I've labeled them here. E building's out of the picture. So this is what they pictured downstate would look like. It looks something like this, but it's also another good chance to see what county looked like in the 1950s. <coughs> so who are some of these people occupying those 3,000 beds? The caption on the back of the, the one with the child reads, Daily Checkup, Dr. Andrew Beto, resident physician, sorry, resident pediatrician at Kings County Hospital, tunes in with a stethoscope on a newborn infant in the hospital's nursery, assisting as nurse Margaret Farrell. And on the right, they're checking patients prior to drawing blood. I want to draw attention to the cigarette the gentleman is <coughs> smoking while his blood pressure. <laughs> More County. We've already seen this boy, Lewis, on the left. And on the right, he had Cooley's disease, which is actually beta thal major. And so he'd received over 450 transfusions at Kings County Hospital. He's meeting his hero, Joe DiMaggio, on the right. On the left, they're demonstrating the brand new technology of stamp the newborn baby foot, stamp the mom's finger, bam, instant birth certificate within five minutes of the child's birth. It's so state of the art. Uh, washing bottles prior to sanitation, sanitizing. And I should also say, in the 1950s, the Brooklyn's population peaked, even from where it is today, at 2.738 million. Right now, we're at about 2.5. Even more care, the Kings County Reading Service close to me, and then further away, hydrotherapy. So now we're back at the 1970s where we started. And although we're down from the overcrowded peak of 3,500, there are still over 2,000 people housed in A, B, C, D, E, F, and let's not forget G, which was the psychiatric pavilion that was built. So after this time, they now start to gradually get reduced to the census of 639 that we have today. In the late 1970s, the nursing school closed, and that freed up some of the remaining space in the R and the T buildings. The T building is now, as you know, predominantly administrative, uh, with a few other functions as well. I'm not sure if this can come up, but this is this is actually a schematic from the 1970s of what's in each building. The numbers are the number of people in each ward. There's the A on the left, the B, the C, the G. The G. There's a K building in the back, but we'll see tops. Um, we didn't have D or S, and then they had a couple other small outlying buildings, like a tiny F building and a few other things going on. But as you can see, these were full all the time. They were still trying to fit a lot of patients. It's a little shout out to our department. This is from the old, uh, from the C building prior to its renovation. Um, you know, as uh, Dr. Sinner, had allowed me to say when he started working here in 1985. Uh, he was in the C building as a second year medical resident. And um, maybe it looked something like this. So let's bring ourselves up from 2001 to today. In 2001, the D building was built. All the patients from the ABC complex now had to fit into the D building, which doesn't fit nearly that many. So they transitioned over. The S building, our building, in 2005, including the new ED, finally moved the ED from the C building to the S building. What else came along? The operating rooms, which had still been in use in the B building up until 2005. I find that incredible. The E building, same building, tubercular building, gets remodeled in 2006 and is ready now as the functioning outpatient unit that we know of it. The thing I thought was kind of interesting from a little fun fact is that this, the, all three of these, so the, re, the renovation as well as the D and the S complex, were designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, which is actually a world-renowned firm. They built buildings like, I don't know, the Sears Tower, the Burj Khalifa, which is currently the world's tallest building. It's located in Dubai, and about 10,000 other major office buildings. Some glamour shots. <laughs> this is actually, the, I don't know if you remember, but the pre-op upstairs in S. And finally, our last new building, the R building, um, really opened for business in 2010. It moved the, behavior, the uh, psych treatment from seven different scattered buildings around campus to one centralized location. The G building is left vacant after this time. And this is the map. When you go to the Kings County intranet and you click on Kings County map, this is what we get. It's mostly accurate. 
Uh, so here's what we know today, right? T building, R building, A, B, C as we know it, D and S, <laughs> Z is the power plant behind us, E building, F, G, J, and N all demolished, the parking garage is where it's indicated, and then we actually own that whole other block up north where the ME's office is, and there's a bunch of, there's a laundry, there's actually Sodexo does a lot of their cooking so we can re-therm it um, on the Kings County campus. I think that's why it's so hard to get extra trace. <laughs> of all these buildings, the only functioning ward outside of D is really A5. <laughs> so I went to look for the library. <laughs> I was like, I'll start at the library. We're a hospital, right? We have a library. No, we don't. We have a room that used to be the library, and they conduct press gaining training there. <laughs> but walking into the T building, I know I missed it probably the first 30 times, and now, you know, going through, you see it again. But when you come in the main entrance to the T building, what we know is the main entrance on the R side, if you look up, right behind the scaffolding, we have this beautiful entryway. We have, there's a lot of inter, uh, inset glass tile, there's this beautiful bronze letter, uh, letter carrier that has been taped over so many times so no one actually mails anything in it. Um, these double barrel uh, vaulted arch ceilings. They still have a lot of original fixtures. Just off to your left when you come in, the original mail room with all the brass um, mailboxes. They have the original light fixtures. There's a lot of signs up that say like Medicare and WIC and hospital police and stuff, so I think it's really hard to sometimes notice these features that are left over from kind of a time where they really built buildings to last a little bit longer sometimes. The um, sunlit rooftop suite of the T building, rumored to have been a basketball court, is now actually functioning as a mosque. So the ABC today, I went up and down to all the floors in the ABC, and then I was fortunate enough to meet with the Kings County Buildings Department, and I met the Kings County Architect and some of the consultants, and I had a great time meeting all these people who taught me about the history of Kings County, and they got me access to a couple of extra interesting places, uh, but some of these are still open to you today. So here's a typical hallway. Uh, I want to say it's like A9 or C9. Um, there's a lot of space that's not, hasn't been retrofitted, because remember, the ABC complex Aside from select wards, the sickle cell ward in the day hospital, the cancer center, the dialysis unit, to name a few, most of these wards haven't really been retrofitted. The only major structural change that was made to any of the wards is that they went from 20-bed wards to 16 to 8, somewhere down to 2. But even as recently as 2001, 2002, we still had gang showers and gang bathrooms. Individual patient bathrooms didn't necessarily uh, individual patient rooms didn't necessarily have their own bathroom. So look at this long hallway. It's one of those hallways where you're like, oh my god, I can't believe they called a code over in the A building lobby. You know, we take off at a trot down the hallway. But if you can picture it, picture all these hallways teeming with people. They fit an extra 2,500 people more than we're used to in these hallways. Our old operating suite located on B2. They still have the original light boxes from 1930s and then replaced in the 1950s. And then central storage has taken over some of the room in the operating suites. There's a lot of uh, remodeling and repurposing going on. Rehabilitation. Our prison ward, located on 831, uh, also used by storage by a bunch of different groups. There's some offices, and the hospital police actually has a little mini, you know, gym in there. Which I thought was great. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. It's like a little bar and, you know, some uh, bench, weights. So this on the right, I, I tried to capture the whole room, was, a, was actually a 16-bed ward. Um, you, had eight, um, you had eight on one on each half. And you know, this was in use, remember, right up until they, we stopped accepting prison patients, so sometime in the 1990s. They added in all the gases, oxygen, air, suction at the head of the bed, but they still kept on all very modern uh, prison bars. And another example of a ward, this is the old urology ward on A22. Uh, things, aside from being cosmetically upgraded, they, they weren't necessarily retrofitted to be the modern hotel like environments that we have today. Nursing stations. The one on the left you might recognize, it's right outside where we do our training um, for ACLS and stuff like that. 
Um, it has not been updated at all. It, you can even see a 1970s phone there and the post-it board that they used. On the right is the one from the Sickle Cell Day Clinic. Got a face left, but basically it's the same thing. On the left we have the B building exit uh, and entrance from the 1960s and as it stands today. Not everything is quite that run down. If we go through these double doors, these are the back of them, they're lovely. They've been opened up for a while, they got repurposed as a mail room, but that's, they fixed that problem. When you walk in, there's also a huge plaque dedicating to the beginning of Kings County. And this is fully accessible, not from the front doors, but you can go from right where you duck inside behind the B building entrance. There's a faux marble staircase and wall plaque dedicated to the, all the physicians that were on the medical board that had served, <coughs> that's what the plaque is. And as you can see, there's a beautifully painted wood ceiling that's original and hasn't been restored, or fortunately, hasn't been blemished too badly. <coughs> so let's touch back on the Kings County dedication for one minute. Let all who serve here remember that this institution is dedicated to the care of all who are helpless and afflicted, this before all else. It's even engraved at the top of the B building entrance on the inside. Let's take a trip to the roof. This is the top of the A building. It was originally meant as a place for people to sit outside, enjoy their lunch, and it's built structurally for people to go up there. It's identical to the one on the C building roof. A couple more views of the A building roof. You can see the T building off in the background. And these are just some examples of the fine detailing that was put in. You know, these aren't cost effective, but they're enjoyable aesthetically and provide a good function. And then looking up at the roof of the B building from the roof of the A building. They actually had central sterilization up there for a while. What you can see on the right, the abandoned conveyor belts, and then you have a room with this abandoned sterilization equipment, and then right outside is the B building, the rest of the porches. And this is looking out of the building from the top of the B building. So we had our blueprint, and now we built it. We had one fine day, we looked at where they put all those people throughout these two centuries, and we looked at where the buildings are now. Our buildings carry a rich history of our care for our patients. Many have been rehabilitated into lovely new units in the C building, I didn't, unfortunately, because of patient care, I couldn't get good images of the sickle cell of cancer center, but I show you they're lovely. Um, dialysis. But almost none of the other units have had any major rehabilitation. Their offices, they're being used for other resources, and aside from A5, none are functioning wards the way they used to. There are many improvements in progress, and there are plans for expanding our clinical care areas because, like before, we still do face some overcrowding problems. So we of Kings County have been taking care of afflicted patients for 185 years at this point. A lot of the same problems remain, but crowded or not, we carry on. So this before all else. Thank you. Uh, take five minutes and we're going to go into our bounce back lecture.